Okay, here we go. Thank you. I just I just uh, did it. All right. All right. Good afternoon, all. Um, my name is Rudy Shankar. I'm the director of the Energy Systems Engineering Program at Lehigh University. It's my pleasure to to welcome Dana White from Tennessee Valley Authority to be the speaker at our seminar. And uh, again, Dana brings a lot of experience. And I was her colleague a few years ago at TVA. And I think in the chat that we had this, this recently, uh, somebody brought up the name of Kim Green, who is now the CEO of Southern Company. And I know Dana worked a lot with her before she joined TVA, if I'm not mistaken. And of course, during TVA, she was my boss at that time. So uh, nice coincidence there. <clears throat> so Dana's topic, uh, topic title is very, very uh, relevant today. Our generation learning to pivot. You know, I think the whole industry has gone through quite a change and is going through even more rapid changes as we go forward. Uh, Dana is going to talk about TVA, Tennessee Valley Authority, the services they provide, the generation mix, and how power generation organizations have had to pivot over the years as environmental regulations and public opinion have changed. Uh, Dana is the GM, General Manager of Field Services of Tennessee Valley Authority. And those, those of you who are familiar with utility organizations, uh, that position is probably one of the busiest positions. Uh, since PVA is a vertical company, it generates energy, transmits energy. Uh, I'm pretty sure Dana probably is, works 24-7. Uh, uh, at least our office does, uh, I'm pretty sure. As I mentioned, I was a colleague of Dana for a few years, and I really enjoyed working with her. Uh, she has been with TBA since 2005 in various roles, including the operations and maintenance of nuclear, coal, gas, and hydro generation facilities, as well as fleet support roles and corporate safety, business planning, engineering, and technology. Before joining TBA, she worked for Southern Company for 16 years, at Farley Nuclear Plant, where she was, where she held a senior reactor operator's license from the NRC. She has a BS in electrical engineering from the University of Alabama. As a GM of field services, she's responsible for overseeing work management, outage planning and execution, technology support, and key business processes for TVA's assets. She's passionate about leadership and employee development and is currently involved with an initiative offering Dare, Dare to Lead, Lead workshops to improve employee engagement and further inclusion of diversity at TVA. So welcome, Dana, and the floor is yours. Hey, good afternoon. Thank you very much for having me again. Um, I am really excited to be able to talk with you this afternoon. As Rudy mentioned, um, I have been in the power generation industry over 34 years, and I have now been with TVA 18 years. So just before anybody starts doing any math around those numbers, I started when I was 10 years old. So let's just make sure we are clear on that. All right. So um, I'm going to tell you this afternoon about what the Tennessee Valley Authority is and what we do. I'm going to tell you more about me, talk with you a little bit about Dare to Lead, and then I will open it up for questions. And so, as Rudy mentioned, I've titled this Learning to Pivot, and uh, because there's a lot happening in the power generation industry over the years, but it also um, ties to my personal life and how I have had to change my approach and think differently um, after so many years in the industry. So the word pivot, it's a verb to turn or twist and to change your opinions, statements, decisions, so that they are different from what they were before. We'll start with TVA. It is a public power company owned by the federal government. And people believe that when they hear that we are a federal entity, that we receive taxpayer money. That is not true. We no longer receive any federal funding. TVA is fully self-funded. 
We serve seven states. We have over 260 generating sites. Those um, run the gamut from nuclear, coal, gas, and hydro. We also have, uh, I think it, it's more than 12 solar sites, but I have lost track at this point, one wind site. And we also um, have over 16,000 miles of transmission lines. So mentioning transmission, we do not do distribution. So that's for our local power companies. Tennessee Valley Authority, um, we actually in May of this year celebrated 90 years of service to the Tennessee Valley. Um, really, really excited about that. And um, to give you some background, TVA was born back in the depression when Franklin Roosevelt was president and um, in the Southeast in particular, um, the, the folks in the region were very poor. There was a very low literacy rate. Um, the lands would suffer from intense flooding and then erosion. And so it was just very difficult for people in the Tennessee Valley to be successful. In 1933, the Tennessee Valley Authority Act was um, put into place. And what is different about us, not only are we a public power and not stakeholder owned, our mission is very different and it's to serve the people of the Tennessee Valley. And so that's interesting, right? When we talk about stakeholder companies, um, while they certainly are doing good things for the area that they work, their mission is to make money right, return on investment. And when we look at Tennessee Valley Authority, it's a different mission. And sometimes the, the uh, it can be contradictory feeling at times to try to run Tennessee Valley Authority and all the, the things that we're intended to do. But most importantly, we want to improve the quality of life of people in the Valley. Our three E's, um, when we talk about serving the valley, we, we are always going back to the three E's. So energy, we want to provide reliable electricity at the lowest cost possible. Um, we are here to manage the integrated resources of the, the integrated national resources that we have here in the valley. And um, Tennessee Valley is a beautiful area, lots of water and mountains and foliage, um, a beautiful place to be and live. And then economic development. And we, it's important that we take active steps to, be, to bring industry into this area to provide jobs for the people that live here. That's another way of making their life better. So energy, environment, economic development are three E's. So when we talk about the different challenges of the three E's, you know, a lot um, has happened. I'd say, I feel like a lot's happened in the last five years, the last 10, 20, just so much has changed that has required us to rethink about how we do business, to reinvent ourselves, reevaluate um, our generating mix, Lots of environmental regulations. Uh, it's it's hard to keep up. They they seem to change regularly, right? Depending on the administration that's in office and where we're dealing with air and water, um, you name it. That those are things that um, are very near and dear to us. Public opinion, right? If you go back fifty years ago, we didn't have social media. People just turned their lights on. They were glad to have their electricity. Um, didn't even think so much about, you know, where it came from. And now the big desire is to have clean energy. And then what does clean mean? <laughs> COVID, definitely a game changer, right? You know, if you go back five years ago, I never would have been doing this discussion with all of you 
you know, from my home and it has been a blessing in some ways, but um, been a very difficult time for our employees. Many people are dealing with, with loss um, of people that were very near to them. Their way of life has changed. So that's the thing we have to think about with our employees and being sensitive to their needs and how they have changed. Cybersecurity is, you know, another area that requires constant vigilance that we did not deal with before. And for the generating industry, you both have it in the space of information technology, the normal information systems that we use to share information um, across different platforms, our PCs and the internet, but also at our plant sites, there is operational technology and relays and um, electronic devices that we also have to be leery of from a cybersecurity standpoint. And with as many locations as we have and different types of assets in Tennessee Valley, that's just a, a huge, huge number. Infrastructure changes. When I mentioned that TVA is 90 years old, well, we have a lot of old transmission lines, uh, transmission poles, even quite a number of our hydro sites are very old with old technology and that becomes challenging at times to maintain. Um, energy demand, uh, balancing the, the, the supply and demand, as we went into COVID, TVA believed that our energy demand was going to remain flat um, for quite a number of years. As a matter of fact, we had seen some decline in the, in the energy load in the Tennessee Valley. And then with COVID, with some industries shutting down, we saw further decline. Um, what we were surprised by is that as we started coming out of COVID, the, the load in the Tennessee Valley has drastically increased unexpectedly, and that makes it difficult to um, have enough power, ge enough generating plants on the ground because we are um, retiring coal plants. Um, as you probably heard, some in the public are not really excited about new gas plants. And we can't build new gas plants or new generation. It, it's difficult to build it fast enough to meet the growing load. And um, at times where we have relied on power purchases, those have been harder to come by because of other utilities facing some of the same challenges that we have. You know, we have seen because the cost of living in Tennessee, particularly the Chattanooga area, is low is is relatively low compared to other areas we have people moving from places like california coming into the tennessee valley buying houses uh, at a really high rate and um, just lots lots of things happening and growth here which is which is good um, but it is challenging for us to meet that fast of a growth and then extreme weather. Um, while we certainly are, our plants are designed for expected weather situations in this area, back in December, when we had Storm Elliott come through and the temperature and the wind chill changed so rapidly through a large portion of our service territory, our plant sites had a really, um, really struggled. And so many of them were impacted at the same time. And for the first time in our 90 year history, we had to curtail load. Now we did have procedures and processes that we followed, but the people in the valley are used to very reliable electricity. And so that has been um, a bit of a political storm as well that we have dealt with. When we look at where we've been, I mentioned, and where we're going, um, 
as I said before, the TVA Act was signed in 1933 and our um, power generation portfolio started out mainly hydro, then to fossil, and in the 60s and 70s into nuclear, then pumped storage and gas. And then um, as we go forward, we've got to focus more on um, solar power, batteries, wind, make sure that we keep our hydro as reliable and as functional as possible. Um, we are, I mentioned that we are a public power provider. We are the largest in the United States, public power provider, third largest generator. We have the second largest transmission system and the third largest nuclear fleet and the fifth largest river system. And uh, we're gonna continue innovating for the people of the Valley. Looking at our energy mix here, you can see from 2005 to 2022 to 2030, the shift here where you see that the area in tan drastically decreases. Right now, our current plans have us retiring all of our coal units by 2035. Um, we are, although it doesn't show it here, um, and I will talk about it momentarily, but we're looking to increase our nuclear footprint and uh, maintain our hydro stance. And um, it's still important for us to, we are building gas plants too. That's um, important for us to maintain. A little bit here, this is just a nice visual of our decarbonization journey. Our goal is net zero by 2050. And uh, we're looking to technology innovation to be able to meet those challenges. Very big word for us is innovation. So last time I did not have any slides about nuclear power and someone asked a question about it. And I thought, well, you know, um, I think I presented in February and we've had a lot of exciting things happen at TVA with respect to nuclear power. So Clinch River nuclear project um, would be our first potential advanced nuclear small modular reactor. With my background in nuclear power, this is um, pretty exciting to me to see that this is happening. Um, Lynch River, I think it was in February of 2022 that the board authorized $200 million for us to begin planning, design, studying, uh, initial licensing applications for a small modular reactor. Clinch River is located in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, and um, there it is an area with uh, a lot of support around us for nuclear and the technology needs. In March, we entered into a collaboration agreement with Ontario Power, GE Hitachi, and Synthos around um, cost sharing and standardizing the small modular reactors. We are, go we are looking at a generation three boiling water reactor. And it's interesting, I'm only on the outskirts of what we're doing, but it's really interesting, the concept around standardization. If you have if you're at all familiar with the nuclear power industry, we have so many different types of reactors, different control systems, different equipment, and the cost of operating and maintaining nuclear power is, is a little high, right? It requires a lot of people and a lot of resources. Um, looking to standardize around the design and build will allow us to have a supply chain of parts and equipment that um, we can all pull from, um, both in Canada and throughout the United States and in other countries. We would even have common um, maintenance practices, common operating procedures. It would even allow potentially operators to be licensed on multiple locations for TVA, for example. 
And so where I held a, as a senior rec to our license for one site for two similar, very similar reactors, we could potentially have operators licensed for different sites in the Tennessee Valley because all of these reactors and design and controls are intended to be as much alike as possible. And in doing that, that helps reduce the cost um, by having that common inventory and supply chains and operating practices where we can learn and share with each other much more than we have traditionally. We are, we know it, it, it is really just the beginning with the announcement happening this year. Um, if Jeff Lash, our CEO, he will say that if we build one SMR, we're gonna build 20. So that is extremely <laughs> aggressive and exciting at the same time, but we'll, we'll focus now on Clinch River and we have a, a number of decision gates that we'll go through over the next five years um, with our board to help us determine the, the path forward. And um, so please continue to look toward us and Ontario Power and these other companies as we proceed. Another slide here on um, sustainability. You know, I mentioned that our goal is to make the lives of the, of the people in the Valley better. We are very devoted to our community, being transparent with those we serve, focusing on how to be inclusive and to build a workforce that's representative of, of the people in the valley that we serve. Um, we are particularly focusing even more on resilience after what happened in December of, of last year. Um, just a few of those things I wanted you to share and, and to show how broad TVA is. Here's some, um, another uh, nice slide that our communication folks have, have put together around the energy system of the future. So um, I've told you about TVA, so I will now tell you a little more about me. And I'm going to give you some personal information, but it is tied to the fact that who we are is how we lead. And the things in our past um, have a direct correlation to how we behave and respond and treat others in our environment. I was born in Clanton, Alabama, um, the home of Chilton County Peaches, if you ever travel down to Panama City, you may go down I-65 and go through Chilton County and get a chance to stop at the Peach Park. Amazing peaches and ice cream there. Um, picking peaches though is not as fun as eating them. They're really fuzzy and they make you itch all over. So, I, and I didn't like um, doing that when I was young, even though I had to sometimes. I am uh, my mother here. She has now passed away, but she raised us pretty much by herself. My parents were divorced when I was three years old, and my sister was just one. I am the oldest child. I used to tell people that I learned to be bossy and directive by going through to get my by getting my senior reactor operator's license. My sister will tell you that I was bossy and directive from the moment that she can remember me, and. Uh, I think growing up in a home where my mother, um, she worked at a sewing factory, made minimum wage, struggled really hard to um, support the two of us. Uh, being the oldest child, I, I have a really big, I see a responsibility gene. I feel really, real responsible and take on responsibilities that sometimes I shouldn't to my own detriment. Um, that's a little bit about my childhood. I was a really good student. I went to the University of Alabama, Roll Tide. I would have preferred to say that um, after a weekend where we had won the football game. Um, unfortunately, that was really, really sad. And uh, for me anyway, and reminiscent of some of the challenges we had last season, I will not dwell on that for very long. Uh, having a degree in electrical engineering 
I was the first person in my family to go to college and I chose electrical engineering or engineering because I was good at math and science. I had absolutely no idea what an engineer did. And I literally in high school, when I chose electrical engineering, I thought I would be learn to wire houses and fix televisions. Don't know where I came up with that, but um, that is not what I do. <laughs> um, started out my career at Southern Nuclear uh, it's a subsidiary of Southern Company. Really proud. I went to Farley Nuclear Plant and uh, got my, as Rudy mentioned earlier, my senior re reactor operator's license. That was one of the hardest things I have ever, ever done. Um, much harder than college. You know, I could get in college from class to class, but when you have to pull every bit of information you learn together and to show how it interacts and get on the simulator and prove that you can operate a plant. That's a little, a little intense. Um, wouldn't want to do it again, but wouldn't give it up. I am married uh, with four daughters. My husband, um, I can't say enough amazing things about how he has supported me through my career and helped me build confidence in myself to take on new roles and do new things. I have uh, six grandkids. These two boys in green here are the youngest of the six. And then I have um, a niece and nephew that um, are just as one, they're like kids to me. My sister will even say that because my niece is quite bossy, that she is more like me than like my sister. Um, here are two of my th three dogs. I'm a proud dog mom. Um, I came to TVA in 2005 and I have had different roles at TVA. I started at Watts Bar Nuclear Plant. I was even the director of safety for a little while. Uh, that's when I worked with, with Rudy. Never would have thought, you know, an engineer would, would go into the realm of safety, but I do believe that the connection was tied back to the fact that when you have someone who has um, worked in, led people in some of the plant environments, the more difficult environments that you can make a better connection with the rules on how to keep how to keep them safer and that we care more about keeping people safe than than just policing people. Um, one of the the lessons I learned in that job is up until that point, my leadership positions had been, largely in positions of authority. And while certainly as a leader, when you have positional authority, you want to create positive relationships. And that is the best way to lead people and get what you need. But you have a little bit of a, an advantage, right? When you're the boss. Um, when I was the general manager at Widow's Creek, I went in, had to meet and learn a lot of people. They were amazing. But um, it probably was easier to do things because I was technically their boss. When you go into a role like director of safety, um, you are trying to have an impact on the entire T Tennessee Valley group of employees. And that's over 10,000 direct employees. And at times um, we've had thousands of contractors uh, depending on what's going on, and it becomes about influence with other leaders, and that was a, a big learning opportunity for me, and uh, so while I've had, you know, I can look back and think you learn something out of each role that you um, are afforded in your career, whether you saw it coming or not, and that understanding of influence and relationships was, was a big takeaway for me. Um, talked a lot about myself. This is just one of those word charts that I think are kind of fun. Um, I'm impatient, I'm bossy, I mentioned that. Uh, although I have an engineering degree, I feel like I'm a power plant operator at heart, less, less you know, more, more an operator than an engineer. 
at times I, I'm a hot mess. <laughs> I try to be a supporter of those around me um, while I can run my mouth a lot and people are surprised I am an introvert. So I can talk a lot, but I find my energy and my fuel from having some time alone um, to myself where it's quiet. In the role I'm in now, um, where I have done a lot of operating plants, I'm actually more in a support role over a number of things uh, in field service. I have been responsible for outage support for our non-nuclear generation, field engineering um, support for them. The organization I'm a part of, Generation Services, does provide regional engineering support, um, subject matter experts, technical experts around different programs and systems. We have a safety, human performance, and corrective action program. So a lot is encompassed. Um, in these roles. And although people will sometimes say we're corporate, uh, a lot of us don't like to feel that we are because our folks actually do work um, out at the plants and support the plants day in and day out. So I titled this pivoting and I talked to you a little bit about the definition of pivoting and the power industry having to pivot as things have changed. This is a quote from Robin Arzon, and she's a Peloton instructor. So there are three things that you don't need to get me started talking on, and I'll talk forever. One is my Peloton, two is my dogs, and three is Dare to Lead by Brene Brown. Those are my three topics that you're in trouble if you get me going down. But I saw this quote she put on social media, and it really hit home for me and where I was when I saw this two or three years ago. It's important to acknowledge that sometimes you need to pivot. That includes changing your mind about a goal, an objective, how you're gonna to get to that objective or the timeline for that objective. Pivoting with a purpose is different than quitting. It all comes down to having an honest conversation with yourself. Is it a pivot or are you simply not showing up and then calling it something more palatable. And the nuance makes a difference because I've had times in my career, and even in the last few years, that sometimes you do feel like quitting and you get kind of mixed up about what your purpose is when you don't see your career going um, quite the way you had envisioned. You know, I look back and think about when I was a summer intern in engineering right when Southern Nuclear was formed. And um, I could be a little cocky at times. And I told our chief nuclear officer, George Hairston, one day at lunch that I wanted his job. That's what I wanted to do one day. Now, I am not chief nuclear officer, never will be. At this point, I'm kind of glad I'm, I'm not. That's a um, really, really difficult job and all consuming. Um, but I will say that uh, when I, you know, in your, when you're in college and school, you use grades to measure your success, whether you're doing well. And I was a good student. Um, in, once you get into the work, into work, how do you measure, right? And I had envisioned my worth and whether I was successful tied to titles, and, um, you know, you go manager, senior manager, director, general manager, vice president, senior vice president. Well, I, I personally have felt stalled in my career at times. And um, I've had to, to learn and through Dare to Lead that, that my purpose um, maybe is different than what I envisioned and created for myself 30 something years ago that I had to, that the way I was successful was uh, by becoming the highest leadership position I could be and that running the entire non-nuclear fleet, you know, that was a measure of success. But to measure your success more on how you're connecting with people and know that you are worthy of belonging regardless. And so when I look back over the last oh, 
30 something years, um, you know, the things that I have, have been faced and cha challenges I've faced, you know, they run the gamut, particularly in 89, when I went to Farley Nuclear Plant, the industry was dominated by white males. And in all reality, you still see um, quite a bit of that. When I got my operator's license, I went on shift. I literally had my shift supervisor tell me in the first couple of months of being on shift that shift work was no place for a woman, that I didn't belong there. Always needing to prove yourself. Um, and you know, I am sure white men, everybody goes through that, but um, particularly as a woman where they look at you or sometimes, you know, other people who, um, who are in marginalized groups, there is not an assumption that you have the intelligence and knowledge to be where you are. Whereas they many times will look at a white male and just assume, right? They had everything they needed to get there. As a member of a marginalized group, sometimes you have to prove that over and over. And with every change of leadership, you have to help them see who you are and what you can bring. And um, particularly for women, you're either too soft and too nice or you're too harsh. It is hard, so hard to find the right balance. Um, if you're gonna be in charge and be a leader, particularly in nuclear, you needed to show your strength and be tough. But when you do that, uh, it's not viewed the same way as it's viewed when men do it. People think you are a witch that starts with a B. Literally, it's just this like, if you get tough, then you're, you're bad. Um, I put in here nuclear imprinting and I, and I talk about this when I speak to our dare to lead class, I literally had a mentor when I was in nuclear power who gave me an article on how to swim with sharks as how to lead. And it basically was when we had these meetings, um, the way to swim with sharks is if we're in the big management meeting and Rudy is getting chewed on and bleeding there in front of the other leaders, you do not jump in to help Rudy. No way, because then you will get bitten as well. And um, even better, if you could figure out how to chew on Rudy too and draw some extra blood, it, it, it really was about like, could you be tough and not get pulled down by the others? Now, that helped me as long as I was in nuclear power, but being a shark, did not translate well to non-nuclear power generation, um, even to the safety director role and some of these support roles where you have to have relationships to be able to influence. People don't, people will run from sharks, but they don't necessarily want to follow and collaborate with sharks. Um, I talked earlier about my path being different than desired and worthiness being tied to titles. Leadership is hard. And, um, you know, what's interesting is sometimes we look at leaders and we think that they, that it must be easy for them. And I had a female leader that I worked with years ago before I was the safety director and I worked with you, Rudy. And she was a female that worked at Widow's Creek. And I would see her periodically, um, as I went into different roles and I gave a, I had a small speech at a women in history month. And I talked about, you know, the struggles and how hard it is being a leader and my insecurities. And she literally, she sent me a note when she saw that. And she said, I literally never imagined that you had the same fears and struggles that I had. She thought that some, because I was a leader that it was easy and that I was never insecure. So many times when you appear confident, you don't feel confident, right? There's a lot of, of showmanship in that. And she meant that as a compliment when she sent me that note, but I actually felt like I let her down 
she had known me for years as a leader and didn't see that I was just like her um, and that she could have, she could have, and she, she didn't have to feel like it was so hard for her to be a leader too, and that she wasn't alone. Um, really big on um, inclusion. And when I talk about my purpose and it's tied to Dare to Lead, but I believe my purpose now is to, is to connect with people and be there for people where I get the most reward is when somebody that I have worked with and care about sends me a note like Ray Ray did, or um, I had a, a, a guy that I had worked with for a number of years. He underwent, he had prostate cancer and underwent treatment. And about three, I don't work with him anymore. About three weeks ago, he sent me a note and said that he was cancer free. And he sent me that note the day he had his doctor's appointment because he knew I cared and it, and it made me feel good that he knew I cared and that he cared enough to let me know. So when I talk about, um, you know, advice to people in the workplace, when I first put this slide together, I was like advice to women, you know, 1999 to 2022. And I need to update that to 23. Um, back when I first started, particularly at Farley, it was about competition. I was competing with everybody to be seen and heard and to be successful. And that included other women. Um, you know, with other women came into the workforce or other marginalized employees. To me, equality was you need, you equally need to suffer the same things I have suffered to get here and the same things I have put up with and you need to earn it. Um, how to fit in, right? How to learn how to have uh, talks about nuclear power submarines with guys on shift and not talk about shopping or things at home. Talk about baseball, you know, fit into their conversations, make them not feel uncomfortable with you. Work harder than anybody else. You're always proving yourself and don't bring your emotions to work because uh, that's going to make men even more uncomfortable with you. Now, <laughs> I don't like that advice anymore. Uh, I say it's important when you go out into the workplace for, for any, any employee, any leader, any person to support and mentor others. Um, lift somebody up. They, if you had to suffer to get where you were and to fight, that person shouldn't have to fight for those same things lift them up and help them get there without having the battle scars. Be your whole self. It is important to be accepted for who you are in the workplace and you need to listen and develop relationships with others so that they can be their whole self and that you can trust and respect each other and what you each uniquely bring to the table. Trust yourself and bring your full self to work. So it's, it's so much different now and, and the advice that uh, I give to new or older people um, in the workplace. Um, I talked a little bit about this, like positional authority uh, versus influence. Even when you have that positional authority, the, uh, the ability to connect with others and to empathize with others and to work with them to get to common places and help them develop and grow. Um, that influence is really critical to your success, relationships, collaboration and trust. Um, this is a Brene Brown quote. It turns out that trust is in fact earned in the smallest of moments. It is earned not through heroic deeds or even highly visible actions, but through paying attention, listening, and gestures of genuine care and connection. Um, in the Brene Brown's Dare to Lead training, she talks about a marble jar, and and uh, you know you think about your relationship with someone, and uh, all those little things put marbles in the jar, right? When they ask about how your sick mother is doing, 
or they notice that you don't seem yourself that day. Um, when they ask about your kids, um, when you talk about shows that you both love to watch or our movies or um, at restaurants, all those little things, you fill up those jars with marbles. And then that way, if you have a hard spot or you run into a disagreement, you may have one small marble come out, but you got a lot built up in the bank there in the relationship space. Um, Renee Brown, uh, chain, the, her work has just changed me so much, both personally and professionally. We have for the last two and a half years had a Dare to Lead facilitator, Sabrina Moon, come in and do a three-day workshops. We've had over 300 people go through it and amazingly positive response from folks, I wish all 10,000 TVA employees could go through it. One of the things, and it's it feels a little different than most training we have, and that's why it's a workshop. Um, and people are a little hesitant when you come in there and you talk about, we're gonna talk about emotions, people wanna leave. Um, now, why do we do it? If you look back over the years, at one point in time in our history, jobs were about muscles and physical strength doing physical activities. And then we've gone through a stage where it was around education and your intelligence. Um, but as we step into, continue to step into this new and different world and different generations um, are coming through, it's more about the heart um, and how you care about people and care for people and who they in, then will in turn care about you. And so like why, you know, and Dare to Lead, we talk about changing ourselves as leaders. And I would say it's less about changing as a leader for me. It was more about coming into myself and helping others see my true self rather than armor I was putting up um, to protect myself. You know, for us, it has tied really closely to inclusion with diversity, driving employee engagement, building psychological safety. That's been a a buzz terminology for the last three years, but there's a lot of truth into it about creating an environment where people feel comfortable bringing forward issues. It actually, psychological safety has a really strong tie to physical safety and whether or not employees are willing to bring issues to the table and bring you their concerns about their work environment. We need to be braver leaders and, and create courageous cultures. When we talk about leadership, um, it can be, the word can be misleading. People think about it's like someone who manages people, but that's not the case. A leader is anyone who takes responsibility for finding the potential in people and processes and has the courage to step forward and develop that. It's not about what your job title is or if you have a bigger office than the other person. You just got to, um, step out there. In Brene's work, she talks about rumbling with vulnerability and that being very important and being able to be courageous in the workplace and build courage. Um, you've got to work, be able to work through emotions when there's uncertainty, risk, and emotional exposure. And, and this, the last three or four years have been tremendously risky and um, uncertain and people have those feelings whether we want to acknowledge them or not and they do show up at work and sometimes they can create hard spots in in getting to the right answer the right conclusion or even create behavioral problems and if you think about giving, leaning into those problems and having a rumble or a hard conversation, um, you know, what I have found at work is that in, at TBA and in so, so many places, we shy away from hard conversations. When something is not going as planned, if someone is not performing as needed, it's easier just to 
give them a meets on their performance review and just move on and let the next leader take care of it. And you really need to figure out this dare to lead training gives you some language and approaches on how to have those conversations and getting, you know, working through the sticky middle of it. When we talk about um, whether or not you can lean into your emotions and hard conversations and challenging things, um, whether they're at work, your personal life, you, people you'd think, well, what stops you is, is that you're afraid. But it's not the fear as much as it is what you do in response to that fear. Um, and when you feel out of control, we, most of us tend to put up barriers or armor is, is how she calls it. And an example of that would be for me, one of my armors is being a knower that probably comes from being the oldest child. Like I talked about, um, being a good student in nuclear, I always had to have an answer, um, you had to be really good at figuring out how to respond to things on the fly that you could never give an I don't know answer. And um, when I get uncomfortable, I will tend to take control of us, try to take control of the situation, dominate it and put what I know out in front of me rather than stepping back and letting others play into solving the problem or working through the different situations. And when you put up armor, like snake skin, um, that corrodes trust and um, you're not being vulnerable. All right, well, that's me. Um, that's a little bit about uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority, Dana White. Um, my passion for dare to lead and building connections with others and making a difference in people's lives. So I uh, um, got, I have now have time for questions. And I'm gonna pull this screen down just so that I can see you all better. Stop sharing. Rudy, I think you're muted. All right. Well, thank you, Dana. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, folks, I, you know why I enjoyed working with Dana so much? I think she brings out so much in, you know, in, a, in an environment where uh, it's, a, it's a difficult place to work. Uh, people are, have some terrific qualifications. You know, being a senior nuclear reactor operator is, is quite an achievement. And so uh, Dana, you have brought out all the things that I want my students to learn about leadership. You know, it is, uh, it's not just title, it's problem solving and it's a great job you did. All right, so we have time for Q and A and as I've done in the past, I'd like the students uh, to ask the questions first. Uh, students, uh, unmute yourself, introduce yourself and ask that question. Uh, you, you can put your question in the chat box and once the students are done, I will uh, solicit questions from uh, all of you. All right, questions for Dana. Questions for Dana. Students, unmute yourself. How you doing, Miss Dana? Can you hear me? Yes, I can. How you doing? My name is Jovi Glumph. Uh, I'm currently overseas right now in the military, but I'm very interested in your story. Um, so I do have a, a question just because uh, my uncle was um, a nuclear engineer. Um, so I get the the pressures of being a minority, especially in the, the nuclear realm. Um, just as a woman, I guess, uh, within your profession, like what are some things that you did to kind of even the playing field to kind of give yourself a competitive advantage? and to be able to, I guess, create an environment where you can implement some of your leadership strategies and styles, even though that may not have been uh, an easy thing to do. Well, um, the, so that's a, that is a, a hard question. I would tell you that some of the things I did 
I wouldn't recommend doing now. Uh, you know, I, I was not always encouraging of others, but if you look now, and even with the women I interact with um, who work in nuclear power now, it, it, I would say, find allies. Um, and as a woman or a minority, right, your first inclination is to seek out other people like you. And I certainly encourage that. Um, when you look in nuclear power right now, they have some good programs that the site at the sites and organization support as well as um, their global, more global. Women in Nuclear is a really good organization. And there's another one called, I, and I may say this wrong, but North America Young Generation in Nuclear. So those are ways to build um, allies both in your work site and more globally. Uh, also be yourself and reach out to others and work to develop relationships also with people that are not like you. Um, I think that having, having really good listening skills and seeking to understand and making sure that when you are um, going to someone for advice or asking information, that your behaviors and actions show that you are truly listening and, and value that input. Um, trust in yourself and your own self-worth rather than feeling like it is critical for your worth to be tied to the acceptance and behaviors of others. Sounds good, thank you, ma'am. You're welcome. Any questions for uh, Dana, please unmute yourself, introduce yourself, ask the question, please. While y'all are thinking on questions, I can share a question I got recently out of Dare to Lead when I spoke. Um, one of the guys in there, he's, he, uh, he and I are around the same age, have worked together, and he said, you know, he had received some, he had dealt with some similar struggles that I have had with respect to not feeling like his career was successful, and he asked me, how did, what did I look to, and and what did I think about when I measured whether or not I was being set successful? And um, I actually used that going into that room that day, because when I went into that room, there were about 18 people in there. Some of them I had not seen in person in quite some time. And literally that several of them wanted to hug me. Um, waved and smiled and you felt some immediate connection with several people in the room um, that is you know something you have that you have to start thinking about and focusing on if connection with others is important not um, not necessarily whether that person is a VP or um, a director or a GM but that that person is human and they are uh, connecting with you. All right, questions again, I'll uh, open it up to the general audience. Questions for Dana. Go ahead, Martin, unmute yourself. We can't hear you. Dana? Hi, Ron. Uh, thank you for a very uh, good presentation, Dana. That's really very interesting. Uh, I have a question for you and also for Rudy. Uh, the, in our Lehigh Valley, there is a IEEE group called Women in Engineering, the Lehigh Valley Women in Engineering uh, group. Uh, I think a copy of your presentation, which I think uh, Rudy uh, made, would really go over very well and, and be a great guide for 
the women in engineering in IEEE in the Lehigh Valley. Uh, so, Rudy, I'm just wondering if you can contact them and, and see whether they uh, would like to see a, a, a copy of that presentation. Again, thank you, Dana. That was very interesting. Thank, hey, thank, thank you for your yeah. kind words. And I, Rudy probably does not have the presentation I showed today. I will send that to Rudy and Susan, and they are welcome to share it. And um, I also am glad to talk to others. Uh, first time Rudy asked me to do this, I was like, huh, somebody asking me? I don't know. That's crazy. Um, but I didn't screw it up enough that he didn't invite me again. <laughs> and usually I can build upon and make adjustments to what I have done previously. So that makes it much easier. So I am I'm glad to uh, share with others. Yeah. Hey, Ron, that's a great suggestion. Uh, let me tell you what uh, the students do as an assignment uh, for every talk that they listen to. Uh, they are supposed to put together what I call a Zoom cast, like a, uh, it's almost like a talk show that they produce, you know, discussing what they heard. And I not only would like to share, you know, Dana's presentation, because I think it is so valuable in an organization, but especially for some of the things that she has gone through, you know, throughout her career, it's really uh, an important lesson. How how do you work in such an environment, and how do you kind of uh, advance yourself? Uh, so I'll have a chance to put the Zoomcast together when the students uh, finish it, and uh, uh, it's you know we could not only share what Dana has uh, presented here today, but reactions from students. That's a great idea. I, I'd love to kind of talk to IEEE. Okay, Mohammed, you have a question? Yes, Professor. Uh, how are you, Dana? Thank you for your presentation. I'm engineer Mohammed. I'm a student at Master of Energy Engineer, and I have 10 years experience in the field of the power generation in natural gas power plants. Uh, my question is, uh, I see that uh, Tennessee have uh, a good job in the field of decarbonization. They reduced our, um, about 50% for, from the CO2 emissions. My question is, uh, what is the big effect uh, reducing this CO2 emission? Is it due to uh, not, uh, nuclear power plant change or a change in from coal to natural gas? What is the highest effect? To reduce this amount. What is the philosophy to reduce the amount? Is that no, what you asked? Not the philosophy. What is what, what is the uh, main uh, main main contribution in this uh, percentage? As I see, you you reduce the amount around fifty percent from the carbon emission. What is uh, what's contribute uh, the most contribution in this world? Is this uh, natural gas uh, from changing a power plant from coal to natural gas or uh, installing more nuclear power plants? The biggest reduction is from us retiring our coal plants mm -hmm. and replacing those with natural gas. We did um, put Watts Bar Unit 2 in service several years ago, which also helped build the nuclear side. For the coal plants that we continue to operate, we have done design changes to install environmental control systems to reduce the emissions, but the biggest contributor is um, retiring the coal plants. Okay, thank you. Questions for Dana? Questions for Dana? Uh, you know, Dana mentioned she was a plant manager at Widows Creek. You know, that is a, that was a coal plant that was, I believe it was decommissioned, if not uh, uh, planning to be decommissioned. So she has uh, a role in the nuclear power plants, Farley and uh, Southern Company. She worked at Watts Bar. 
at TVA. She was a plant manager. These are very stressful jobs. And the plant managers are ones who always have a phone glued to their ears because somebody's calling them about a problem. And to work through all that, uh, it really requires skill. Human skills are the most important. Yeah, thank you. Surviving through some of those times, it's not nearly as intense now, but I think one thing is building a strong team around you and having having trust in those around you and um, not trying to micromanage too much, even though I, I, I can pretty quickly get into micromanagement and control mode. Um, that is, I think, a big deal to, you know, when as, especially as you transition to bigger roles where you're not the doer, um, but your your comfort zone is doing and being in control. So trusting others becomes really important during that time. Yeah, I have a question for uh, Dana from uh, F. Richards uh, to the chat box. Uh, great to hear TVA has a balanced national approach to power sources and realizing that we can't survive on solar and wind alone, at least for the foreseeable future. How do you address that issue with so many who don't understand energy realities? That's a tough one, right? <laughs> People want their electricity, but they don't want you to generate any uh, emissions. For us, it, it is having a large community presence. Um, we try to stay very active in the community at volunteer events. We work to establish, we have um, teams who work to establish strong local government relations and regional government relations. And we do have a pretty good presence on social media now for TVA. We also um, love to go into schools and educate young people about how you make electricity, the challenges, and um, you know, teaching them early. And we also highlight a lot of what we're doing in technology space to figure out what the next thing is. And I think the uh, SMRs and pub the public publicizing that so much is is another way of trying to show people we do want to get there. It just takes time. And I think that if you look back and see that we have met commitments to shut down coal plants and we're on a good trajectory, we try to show people those things. Now, that doesn't mean that that makes everybody happy. Um, but it's largely trying to communicate and educate um, the different groups of people around us and to, to try to bring value in other ways as well so that we're seen as a good community steward. Another question in the chat box, uh, Dana, uh, with SMR, this is from Dave Ellis, uh, with SMR Future, does TVA see a possibility to locate SMR at sites where fossil generation has been retired? Hmm. You know what? I don't know the answer to that, but that I'm curious about now that now that you pointed out, we talk a lot about Clinch River because that has been a site that I guess back in the 70s, Rudy, you may know, probably in the 70s, we were, we were looking to expand nuclear power beyond the three sites that we have presently. Clinch River was identified um, back then. We also have explored multiple times doing something at Bellefonte, which is a, a location that is just outside of Chattanooga in Alabama as an option. But I don't know if we're looking at previous um, coal sites. I do know that at some of the coal sites we're looking to put, we're putting gas generation at Cumberland Fossil Plant, although both of those units are still in operation, our future um, combined cycle plant plans include putting a site at Cumberland. That, that is sort of in a Nashville 
region on that side it particularly neat is is also growing a lot um but i but i don't know i don't have a lot of specifics about that well you know it's an interesting question that they raised because this uh, new inflation reduction act you know mm -hmm. incentivizes these energy communities and so there's a especially if the you know if the incentives are strong enough and why not and I think TVA, again, as before, they could sh show the way how SMRs operate in a realistic environment, and that may kind of uh, also be a big uh, incentive going forward. Good question, David. Yeah. And, you know, Rudy, um, historically, TVA ha at times has not been able to take advantage of some of the government um, opportunities as other utilities have. But yeah. we actually can take advantage of some of the things that are coming out of the Inflation Reduction Act and have put together an organization. I think Cindy, you'll know, or not everybody else, Cindy Heron um, mm -hmm. is involved with that now. Oh, okay. uh, looking at and bringing ideas forward and how we can take how we can take advantage of some of the opportunities in the Inflation Reduction Act. So that's mm -hmm. that's a, not good for us. Uh, again, I, I do know Cindy, so that's good. Thank you for that input. Uh, Rudy, I believe Glenn has his hand up. Glenn? Uh, yes. Hi. Sorry, Glenn. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Uh, Glenn Michael, class of 1984, electrical engineering, Lehigh. Uh, nice to meet you, Dana. Um, so uh, I read in an interview with one of the TVA uh, spokespeople or whatever uh, that uh, – you're buying solar as fast as you can, and that there's just basically no more solar panels available on the market to buy for TVA. Uh, I don't think I've seen that from other utilities, but what do you think can be done to speed that up? And you know, if you could, would you be able to get to net zero before 2050, say 2040? You know, um, I believe it's largely supply chain and manufacturing issues that have um, and it's due to a high demand of solar panels. You know, I don't know the specifics there. I would say that I don't know if building it fast, getting solar faster helps us get to net zero quicker. And I'll tell you why, because what we have to struggle with is the balance. So for example, when we invest in solar power, we typically have to, when you add it, you, you don't get to add it just exactly on top of your generation capabilities. You almost have to have the equal amount, Be at, you also have to be able to generate an equal amount of that power in a different way or, or provide backup power in a different way, such as through batteries which haven't been well developed because say you get you if the you know what some some of our summer afternoons right you're sunny and hot 100 degrees and then all of a sudden you have um afternoon thunderstorms in it and they come through and then you don't have the solar you pretty quickly got to be able to respond um and so we have to balance with solar, we have to balance the ability to respond quickly when it goes away. That's a similar challenge for wind, although this area is not really good for wind like we are for solar. The batteries are going to be key. You know, another thing that, um, and I cannot talk on this intelligently, but one of the nuances to changing the generation mix has to do with the inductive load on the system. And for instance, we are, we are evaluating putting, um, doing something different with Bull Run where we can use the generator there in a way to be a capacitor. Um, because typically with the type of generation we have, there's momentum and things where it just doesn't shut off on, off on. And some of these newer sources of electricity, they do challenge the way we operate the grid and we have to, we're having to make adjustments to our transmission grid as well to, 
to deal with some of those dynamics and being a person who has mostly made electricity during my career I don't understand some of that as well but it's interesting to hear those on the transmission side of our organization talk about the things they're having to do differently um, with the different generation mix so it's requiring us to invest in, in that area as well that you wouldn't normally think about. Yeah, sure. I, I just want to make one comment. That's why we have all these young engineers going through Lehigh right now, is to learn all the smart grid technology uh, to compensate for the way that renewables generate power, uh, you know, differently than the old baseload generation in thermal plants. Yeah. That's a very interesting topic. Um, I just got exposed to something, a, a conversation on it recently, and it was like, wow, never even thought about that part of it. Well, you know, on October 2nd, we, in our seminar, we'll just look at that very uh, issue, Glenn. Uh, how do you manage the grid when there's large-scale penetration of renewables? Uh, there's some crazy things that happen that are not well explained. So October 2nd is that seminar. Questions for Dana? Questions for Dana? I have a question about the nuclear generation. Jessica, Jessica go, ahead. go ahead. Okay. Um, so I was interested. I don't know if you might have touched on this when you talked about it, but the small modular reactor units, is the approval process to build those different than large reactors? Because I know, obviously, we all know nuclear is definitely a controversial topic amongst the American public. And so sometimes getting new reactors approved is a difficult process. I was curious if it was maybe easier with those modular reactors or how they're being received by the public. Yes. Yeah, so when I talked a little bit about standardization, it comes in there. Um, if we, if multiple utilities use the same design, um, that does make the licensing process much simpler. Now there are certainly location specific things that have to be taken into consideration around stability and cooling, but the goal of using that standardized approach would be that as we start building SMRs in the, Uni in the United States, as we deal with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is that as much as possible, they would be the same design and that would expedite the licensing process and also make the construction process and operations process um, simpler. Thank you. Yes, now we, we have not been nuclear, new nuclear sites in a while, but as I've interacted with some of, on the SMR project, we're bringing in industry consultants who have worked in other countries on bringing new nuclear generation online. So that's a, a good way for us to learn also. Questions for Dana? You want to put your question in the chat box, please go ahead or unmute yourself and ask a question, please. Okay. All right. Uh, no more questions for Dana. Well, Dana, thank you very much. You know, I think uh, some of the Topics that you mentioned are so important for, you know, our students coming into the workforce. And, uh, you know, you, you touched upon so many different aspects. And uh, we will discuss it in our, when we put this Zoomcast together. And I'd love to share that with you. Uh, love that. Anyway, thank you very much, Jana. And thank you guys for attending. Uh, again, we'll have this seminar uh, in two weeks' time. We'll have 
another nuclear person, I mean, uh, uh, from Luminant, uh, who will be talking about advanced nuclear September 25th. Uh, mm -hmm. Some of the details you can learn la later. Uh, I think we have a, the chat box, a way for you to register for mm -hmm. that. Well, thank you all again, and thank you, Dana, for uh, volunteering to speak today, and uh, you all have a good day. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Rudy, are you still on? Yeah, Martin, uh, now I can hear you. Yeah. Um, is it just you and I on right now? Martin Matajazic and you? There's people still trying to sign off yet. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. That's okay. I'd like to have a one-on-one -on -one with you sometime um, to give you my background, maybe a... Uh, um, I have been involved with Lehigh for some time. In fact, um, do you know Martha Dodge? Do you remember her? Uh, we, I, I've, I know of her. Okay. Uh, yes. Your seminar today was, was very encouraging, very informative. Dana is a great person, as you, as you can tell me, okay? Mm -hmm. um, I'm an older guy, okay? And... Um, I shared with some of my classmates and so on, you know, the, the commissioning of the nuclear units down here at uh, uh, Bogo, okay? And they mm. were all, the, the attitude and uh, everything was very, very negative, as if, you know, our whole future is going to be built on uh, solar and wind, as we know, it is not going to be the case. Data was very good. Actually, I was also manager system ops center for uh, general public utilities a long, long time ago. Okay. And uh, I actually appointed or pr promoted a woman up to uh, uh,